Hey guys, welcome back to good old Lawrence County High School here. We're going to start off a whole new unit in economics because we finished up Econ 1, so we will start a unit called Econ 2. It's amazing how those come in order like that. Uh, from looking at your exams, most people did very well on it. A couple of us maybe not as strong as we could have been, so let's try and do a little bit better on this one. In this chapter or this unit, we're going to look at economic theory. And from looking at these interesting drawings here, uh, you may or may not recognize some of these folks, but hopefully by the time the unit is over, you will know who they are. We're going to start off the unit today talking about maybe one of the most important persons in the study of economics. And this is a guy named Adam Smith. We can see here that Adam Smith was born in 1723 and he died in 1790. And he is known as the father of economics. So I guess he would be pretty important in economics if he's known as the father of economics. Um, he was a Scottish philosopher who wrote a couple of books. Number one was something called The Theory of Moral Sentiments in 1759. And really in this book, Adam Smith, to be honest, he was more of a philosopher than anything else. And he's looking at human beings and why we do the things we do. And he was really trying to understand morality and why are people ethical and why do people do the right thing and why do people not do the right thing. So that's really what this whole study was about. Then he writes another book in 1776 called The Wealth of Nations. Actually, it's called An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations, but we simply call it The Wealth of Nations. <clears throat> and this will ought to be quoted as one of the most important writings ever on economics. So what I want you to keep in mind with Smith, and we're going to look at both sides of this, he starts off writing more about human nature and why we behave the way we do, but then he goes a step further with his next book and he looks at countries. And he's trying to understand why some countries have done well and some have accumulated a lot of wealth and other countries maybe not so much. So he's trying to figure out what generates wealth and why do we do the things we do. And I've often wondered, why do you do the things you do? We'll also see Smith sometimes called the father of capitalism. This guy was the father of everything. And if we've talked some about what capitalism is, we can say, it's an economic theory featuring private ownership of the means of production and the freedom to earn unlimited wealth and profit. So let's break this phrase down here for a second. Private ownership means I can own them, or you can own them, or Ray Kroc can own them, or Henry Ford can own it. The government's not going to own the means of production. People are. What are the means of production? Land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship. So that can be owned by the people. And you have the freedom to learn, earn unlimited wealth and profits. So you can go out and make just as much money as you can possibly make. There's not going to be a limit up where you hit the ceiling and the government says, oh, stop, you've made all the money you can make. You'll use a theory called laissez-faire, which is a nice French term for to leave something alone, which is really the basis for a free market economic system. And when we're talking about leaving it alone, we're talking about in terms of government interference that the economy should run without the government having lots of regulation and rules and taxation. Just leave the market alone and leave the economy alone and let it go by itself and everyone will be much better off. The economy is better off <laughs> without the government or when the government leaves it alone to operate without interference. So like we were just saying, all this goes back to Smith. Adam Smith being called the father of capitalism because he thought that's how markets should operate and we're gonna look closer at that. Here's some things that Adam Smith believes. One, he will say that it's human nature to be self-centered, that you and I are really most concerned about our own well-being and our own self-interest. Do you think that's true? You can pause the video and ponder that for a second. Are human beings self-centered? You don't have to answer it out loud. Now Smith will say that we still like to help other people out. Even though we may be self-centered, we still find pleasure or think it's a good thing to help others out. And why are we doing that? What's the motivation for that? Is that just to make us feel good? And that gets into a whole other discussion of ethics and Immanuel Kant and all those things, but we're not going to worry about that. He is going to say that people act in a way that promotes their own self-interest. So you will do things that make your life better. You will behave in a way that promotes what you think is important. Other things Smith will say is where does wealth come from? Well, from land, labor, and capital. That if you own natural resources, you have people to work, and you have tools and machinery, 
then you're going to generate wealth. And you may say, well, where's the entrepreneurship? Well, Smith is just making this up. So he comes up with a land, labor, and capital idea, and later we'll add in entrepreneurship. Another thing he will say is the vision of labor increases production. You know, that goes back to that whole assembly line idea. But what's what? Smith is writing this stuff in, in the late 1700s. So he agrees that if you can divide jobs up on an assembly line type of production, you will increase productivity. So this is a whole lot for a guy to, to kick out in his uh, book, A Wealth of Nations. Here's an interesting quote. Read this. It is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own self-interest. Benevolence here is just simply meaning from the, the compassion, the compassion of, or that they love you. It's not because they love you that the butcher, the brewer, or the baker fixes the things we want, like dinner or drinks. They do it out of their own self-interest. Now let's think about that for a second. Does that mean when I go to the restaurant and I purchase food, that the people there who prepare my food didn't come to work and say, oh my gosh, there are gonna be hungry people coming in today and I wanna feed them and I know that Mr. Prince is gonna come in and I wanna make sure he gets a good sandwich so I'm gonna work hard and make food. Is that why they go to work? The answer is no. Why did they go to work that day? They wanna make money. That's really it. They come to work every day because they wanna earn money so they can buy themselves things. They're not really worried about me. Think about this. Why am I standing in front of this camera right now, teaching? Why am I here in this classroom? It's clearly because I love you guys and I want you to understand economics. So I guess I don't really fit in with Smith's model. There may be other people that do it for the money, but not for me. All this comes down to something Smith called the invisible hand. By pursuing his own interest, he frequently promotes that of society more effectively than when he really intends to promote it. And Smith says that in Wealth of Nations. So this idea of the invisible hand, I know it was touched on earlier by the crash course folks, but I really want you to understand this. This is one of Smith's most outstanding ideas. Let's look at the invisible hand. He is gonna say, it's Adam Smith's metaphor explaining unobservable forces that seem to keep supply and demand moving towards equilibrium. I know that's a whole lot of economic jargon there, but understand what he's saying. Supply and demand. Supply is how much stuff there is out there for us to buy. Demand is how much you and I want to buy those things. And those are constantly in flux. If we're talking about something like gas or ham or toilet paper, how much is there to be bought? How much do people want to buy? And really what's going to determine that in a market is price. So how do we know where to put the price? Well, equilibrium is the place where a price is set on a graph that makes both producers and consumers happy. That producers are gonna make a profit selling at that price, and consumers are gonna go away thinking, I got a good deal at that price. So that's equilibrium. Both sides are happy. How do we hit equilibrium? Well, Smith is gonna say that these market forces, these, the invisible hand, will help guide the market to where we hit a point where everybody's happy. <clears throat> Other parts. Market forces will cause prices to drop to a level that is beneficial to both producers and consumers. Well, that's sort of what I was just explaining. I guess I should preview my PowerPoints. That we hit a point in the market where consumers and producers are both satisfied, and that's the equilibrium price. He says competition, which means other businesses, will want to gain market shares so they will offer goods at lower prices. Really, he's gonna say some of this is gonna come through greed. And let's think about this for a second. If you see someone who is successfully selling, um, I don't know what we're gonna sell, bicycles, and they're selling bicycles for $80, and people seem to be buying those bicycles for $80, and that seems to be a pretty good price. And you're thinking to yourself, you know, I wanna make some of that money. I bet I can get in this market and I can sell bicycles for $70 and still make money. So I'm gonna open up a bicycle shop and sell them for $70. Well, look what I did. I caused the price of bicycles to come down, so that was good for consumers. Did I do it because I want consumers to be able to buy cheap bicycles? No, 
I did it because I want to make a profit too. And I know I can sell at 70 and still make money. So because I'm greedy maybe that I want some of the market shares, I did something good for society. Which is this point. Through individual self-interest and freedom of production as well as consumption, the best interest of society as a whole is fulfilled. Once again, there's one in this sentence. Through individual self-interest and freedom of production, that means it's okay that if we want to do what's best for us, that's the individual self-interest. Freedom of production and consumption, which means a manufacturer or a firm can make whatever they want to make. If you want to build bicycles, if you want to build truck tires, if you want to make uh, porch swings, you're free to make that. Consumption, remember? As consumers, we're free to purchase whatever we want. We buy and consume whatever it is we find interest in. Some people want to buy baseball cards, other people want to buy uh, fishing poles. So when you throw all this together, what we find out is the best interest of a society as a whole is often fulfilled, but not because producers said, I want to make something good and cheap for the people because I'm worried about them. The producer said, I want to produce something that people will buy so I can earn money. And that's really what drives me. That's not to say that there are no producers or no one in the world who cares about other people, because we do. But our still, our main motivating factor is we want to earn money. We want to do good for ourselves. Self-interest. Adam Smith is going to say it's the invisible hand that guides our economy. So we'll be back tomorrow with even more great looks at economic theory.